The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Building a Safety-Centric Culture in B-Cell Cancers. Interprofessional Insights on Optimizing BTKI Efficacy Through Safety Management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TBV 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, and welcome to Building a Safety-Centric Culture in B-Cell Cancers. I'm Dr. Nicole Lamana from New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center in New York. I'm a leukemia physician and CLL specialist. I'm pleased to welcome my pharmacy colleague, Dr. Peter Campbell, and my nurse practitioner, Christina Rusamano, to this program. Thank you so much for joining me. Couldn't do this without you. Today, we're going to explore team-based approaches to managing safety considerations with the BTK inhibitor class of agents in the different B-cell malignancies. Throughout the program, we'll provide interprofessional insights on how to recognize and prepare for BTK-mediated adverse events and share our thoughts on how to deliver effective therapy with BTK inhibitors in settings such as CLL and mantle cell lymphoma while keeping safety in mind at all times. We will also share several resources for adverse event recognition and management during our discussion. You'll want to refer to these practice aids throughout. So please take a moment to download these practical tools before we get started. So let's begin. So as you know, the BTK inhibitor class is well represented in a variety of diseases, uh, both CLL, SLL, mantle cell lymphoma, marginal zone, and Waldenstrom's. Abrutinib is approved in all of these settings. Acalabrutinib is approved in CLL, SLL, and uh, mantle cell lymphoma, and has studies in marginal zone and Waldenstrom's. Xanabrutinib uh, had initially approval in mantle cell, marginal zone, and Waldenstrom's, and just recently approved in CLL. And then the non-covalent BTK inhibitors that are, that are emerging on the scene, pertubrutinib is the furthest along in develop, development. None of these are yet approved uh, for these diseases, but we anticipate approval and likely with pertubrutinib being the furthest along in development first. Um, based on uh, data from the Bruin study, um, and that has actually uh, results in CLL, SLL, but also covers some of the non-Hodgkin lymphoma subsettings. And then nemtabrutinib uh, has more maturing data on the scene. So we wait for the newer generations of BTK inhibitors and non-covalent and covalent BTK inhibitors that are in development. Uh, so stay tuned for that. In terms of the NCCN guidelines, though, for patients with CLL and SLL who do not have a deletion 17P or TP53, you can see that the preferred recommendations are, that are category one include a calibrinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, venetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor, plus obinutuzumab, and xanabrutinib. Uh, also, a brutinib and a brutinib plus a CD20 monoclonal antibody uh, or, or venetoclax are, are recommended as a category 2B. For patients with CLL or SLL that have a deletion 17P or TP53, you see similar recommendations. Preferred being a calibrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, venetoclax and obinutuzumab, and xanabrutinib, and then uh, abrutinib and abrutinib plus venetoclax, believe it or not, um, as a category 2B. Although the abrutinib and venetoclax combination have not yet been approved in the U.S., this combination was approved recently in Europe. In terms of uh, BTK uh, approvals in uh, mantle cell lymphoma, this is in the second line setting or second line or subsequent setting uh, with BTK inhibitors, acalabrutinib, abrutinib plus or minus rituximab, and xanabrutinib uh, are, again, are the preferred regimens in the second line or subsequent lines of therapy for mantle cell lymphoma, uh, as, as well as lenalidomide and rituximab. So why are we here for this program? And obviously, since these, this class is so effective in these disease states, one of the issues that we're going to educate and talk about are, are obviously some of the side effects of the class in general, how to manage our patients who go through the toxicities um, and talk about drug-drug interactions and discontinuations that do occur because this class is so important in the treatment of these patients. And so I think it's important to try to manage our patients through their toxicity so that we can keep them on very effective therapy. Um, and this is just a, a recent uh, chart review of about 180 patients receiving abrutinib. Now, remember, abrutinib was the first to market. Abrutinib's been around now 10 years, approved in 2013 now. Uh, 
Um, and you could see here the um, discontinuation and dose hold occurred in about 40% of the patients. You can see in the uh, first line setting that the reason why most people can't either were dose reduced or dose discontinued were due to adverse events. That's the darker blue. And then in the relapse refractory setting, similarly, the majority of reasons for dose reductions or discontinuations, again, due to adverse events. There have been a lot of other real world um, experiences. In other words, these are retrospective reviews, to be fair, um, but a very large US experience that we were part of uh, that looked at over 546 patients um, and a Danish experience that looked at about 200 patients. Again, similarly, that the majority of reasons that patients came off of um, the BTK inhibitors, and again, the majority of this work was done in the abrutinib setting before some of the newer BTK inhibitors, um, were due to um, adverse events. And the majority of these adverse events do occur in the beginning of starting drug. And so I think that it's really important to be in tune with that in the beginning when patients are starting a new oral therapy, which is very different than when we gave intravenous chemotherapy and the side effects were in our clinic or in the hospital, and we were dealing with that directly. These are patients taking uh, pills at home and then trying to deal with these side effects and a lot of people stopping drug when perhaps we can get them through that. So again, most of these adverse events we're gonna talk about, but occur in the beginning. This is why I have my colleagues here, because this is the most important reason is that it is not all just me writing a prescription uh, and having our patients start these therapies. It is important to bring in our pharmacist and our uh, extended providers, that includes our nurses, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, uh, those of us, those who work with us in the clinic who manage the patients on a daily basis. And so maybe Chrissy and Pete, you can talk about your roles a little bit and the importance of those roles to us and our patients. Yeah. So oncology, the oncology nurse, and with the oncology nurse, I'll actually group in the advanced practice providers. We're here to support the physician, but also to support the patients. So the main, uh, the main functions that we serve is a lot of patient education. Um, Prior to a patient starting therapy, we spend extensive amount of time helping them through, talking about dosing and possible side effects. But not only that, we actually educate throughout the treatment. We also run uh, drug interactions, make sure none of the medications that they are taking now will interact, and also medications that might be added while they're already on therapy by another provider. We do a lot of care coordination, making sure labs are scheduled, physician visits, and the patients are aware of where they should be and when. Um, we do a lot of side effect management. So patients call us, often we're first call, we're the first ones who hear from these patients. Uh, we walk them through exactly what we should do, what they should do, and we escalate to the physician if there's anything severe. Uh, also, just to mention, in a lot of other institutions, the nurses and the advanced practice providers actually have to do um, prior authorization for a lot of these therapies and find financial assistance for the patients so they can afford these drugs. Yeah, so the pharmacist will also play an intricate role in this process. And I sort of think of it as a continuum of care. You know, you have the advanced uh, practitioners and the oncologist providing the, prescribing the medications. And then the pharmacist will start to pick up from there, doing the initial screenings for looking at the patient's comorbidities, making sure it's the appropriate drug for them in that class, drug drug interaction screening. And then can the patient actually get the drug? As Chrissy alluded to, Oh, even though insurance will pay for a lot of these medications, there's frequently concerns with high copays, prior authorizations being needed, and the coordination of getting copay assistance, grants, those are the things that pharmacists can really step in and help with. And so also, because a lot of the providers have done the initial counseling regarding what side effects to expect, the pharmacists could play a role in that setting or also doing toxicity checks during subsequent visits and making sure that the patients are still able to take their medications. Excellent. And, and I really, I, I mean, I can't undermine at all the role that um, these two have in our practices because it, it really is a team effort. Um, if you think about, depending upon how many patients may be on some of these oral BTK inhibitors on a daily chronic basis, there's a lot of calls. And so you need a team approach to do this. And we're gonna talk about, it's not just them also um, some of the side effects that we're going to go through, uh, having a cardiologist, a primary care physician, there are other uh, providers that also play a role depending upon the side effects that that patient may be going through. And so they're also important to loop in as well. So let's look a little deeper. We're going to talk now about 
um, the BTK class and some of the safety management uh, and adverse events that we see and talk about dosing as well. So as many of you are aware, there's uh, several common toxicities that are associated with this class of agents. Uh, the most common we talk about are the cardiac arrhythmias. In particular, atrial fibrillation is the most common, although patients can also have other arrhythmias. And so you could see ventricular arrhythmias, of course, um, are, are, are obviously uh, significant and important as well. Um, you can have arthralgias or myalgias. Uh, infections, I think, are very common, although they're common to CLL patients in general. Uh, but to be aware, um, it, it, we have a heightened awareness when patients are on therapy with BTK inhibitors and do, and do talk about signs or symptoms of an infection. GI issues such as diarrhea, hypertension, and we're going to talk about that at great length, and then increased risk of bruising or bleeding. So those are the common toxicities we often teach our patients about, and, and so they're aware of them. But there are some other additional toxicities that are annoying to patients. Dermatologic changes, they can have thinning of their hair, nail pitting. Fatigue is an issue, although obviously that can be, fatigue can be uh, for a variety of, e of reasons and you need to sort of partition out what that could be if it's related to drug or not, but definitely could be. Um, and cytopenias can occur, and we'll talk about more with that, particularly with the uh, second generation, uh, such as anabrutinib. I think some of the, just in summary, when we talk about some of these specifically, when we talk about cardiac arrhythmias, um, you know, we tend to try to, or when we talk about initiating the BTK inhibitors, if a patient is on warfarin for other cardiac issues, you know, obviously we know that these drugs can have an increased risk of bleeding. And in some of the initial studies with abrutinib, uh, patients on warfarin, there was an increased risk of bleeding. Sub, there were some subdural hematomas. Uh, and so the, uh, the uh, subsequent studies with the BTK inhibitors tended to exclude patients on warfarin. So it's not that it, obviously it couldn't be done, but you have to really counsel the patients that, that certainly there could be an increased risk of bleeding while on warfarin or any other blood thinner, to be frank. So we try to be a little bit choosy about that. We have newer agents, and again, we're going to talk about that later, uh, but we try to then choose if somebody's on warfarin, whether or not could that be switched to an alternative uh, agent or should we look to a newer agent given the increased risk of bleeding. For new onset atrial fibrillation that develops, uh, of course, you know, certainly we loop in our cardio oncologist or our cardiologist part of that and see if we can use non-warfarin anticoagulation and monitor for signs of bleeding. Uh, in younger patients, of course, get them evaluated if they need cardio, if they need ablation and so on and so forth and discuss whether or not somebody's going to, if we're going to hold therapy or go back on therapy. Hypertension, I think, is very common in our older patient population. So we want to co-manage them again, either with the cardiologist or the primary care doctor if they have an antecedent, you know, hypertension to begin with, you want them well controlled. If they should develop it while they're on a BTK inhibitor, you want to get that attended to as well. And we can think about, we're going to talk more about this with the newer generations. And then arthralgias are a little tricky. They're a little bit more difficult to manage. And we're going to talk about that with some of the cases. Sometimes we can use some supportive care measures, uh, but sometimes, and this may go away with time and be easier uh, when patients um, are on therapy for a while, but there's some patients that no matter what you do, this may be limiting for them. And sometimes they do have to come off therapy despite your best efforts to um, manage some of these side effects. Christina, I think we'll push to you to talk a little bit about abrutinib to start. So abrutinib, our first to market BTK, dosing for CLL differs from that of mantle cell lymphoma. So for CLL, 420 milligrams by mouth once daily, either as a single agent or combined with bendamustine rituximab or obinutuzumab or rituxan alone. Uh, we administer abrutinib before rituximab or obinutuzumab when given on the same day. For uh, mantle cell lymphoma, the dosing is 560 milligrams by mouth once a day, obviously a higher dose than the CLL 420 milligram dosing. We administer at approximately the same time each day with a full glass of water. Uh, the guidelines say that at first missed dose, you can take the next dose and then resume your normal schedule the following day. And if administered with a CYP3A inhibitor, inhibitor there are prescribing uh, information dose modifications, but Dr. Campbell will speak a little bit more about that later in the program. Uh, of note, just patients with uh, mild hepatic impairment would have a dose reduction to 140 milligrams, and those with a moderate hepatic impairment would dose reduce to 70. Obviously, patients with severe hepatic impairment would not receive this medication. 
And just to note, this and other dosing and safety information is available to download as a reference for your practice. So please access these practice aids now if you haven't done so already. Understanding cardiovascular side effects of the BTKs. Uh, these, when you're doing patient education, the cardio, possible cardiovascular side effects will be the most concerning to a lot of the patients. Um, so if we look first at atrial fibrillation, we know this can be frequent and can cause cardiac morbidity and treatment interruption. It's very important that when you're doing your education, you let patients know signs and symptoms, what to look out for. Ventricular arrhythmias are very infrequent, but they can cause sudden death and cardiac mortality. Hypertension, it's a common later side effect with the BTKs. Um, some of these patients might have hypertension before you even start. It's important to know that they are, what medications they're taking and to let them know that there's a possibility that medication might have to be increased and or a second agent added if they have this side effect. Um, and it's important to let people know that they could wind up on an antihypertensive at some point if they become hypertensive. And again, these are frequent and they can potentiate other cardiac adverse events. The increased risk of bleeding will not change. Um, that will continue throughout therapy. Um, it's frequent complex and it can hinder management of atrial fibrillation, obviously. Again, if you're going to put someone on an anticoagulant and you have a medication that already thins the blood, you have to be very careful and the patient needs to be monitored quite closely. Just to, to, I guess to go back a little bit with atrial fibrillation, you know, obviously this is the biggest concern of many of our patients on BTK inhibitors. And, and, and clearly we picked up this in the initial abrutinib studies. Uh, you know, and it actually initially, you know, like most studies, when, when you need more time, the frequency increased the longer uh, the studies went on. And so initially it was reported as 5 to 7 percent. And then with longer follow-up of the initial abrutinib studies, it, it, it increased to, you know, 15 percent. Uh, so I think it's something that you have to educate the patients about um, for sure. Um, I think it's important that that for, you know, we know that many of our patients, remember the median age of CLL is older. So we talk about some of these diseases and for CLL, they're an older patient population, but for, you know, mantle cell as well. So, you know, some of our patients already have comorbid conditions that may predispose them as well. So, so this is important to discuss with them. So you have to take into account if they are older, have heart disease, have hypertension at the diagnosis. It doesn't mean that it excludes them from being treated with a BTK inhibitor but you have to discuss if this is a potential risk factor. Uh, and obviously, you know, clearly we're going to, if somebody develops atrial fibrillation, we're going to plug them in with a cardiologist, talk about whether they need holding of therapy uh, and then management uh, of their atrial fibrillation. Thankfully, most people actually can be cardioverted or even go back into normal sinus rhythm with cessation of therapy and starting, you know, treatment for a fib. But then you'll discuss whether or not you're going to continue that therapy uh, in the future or switch to a different agent. And that's a complex discussion, no doubt. Uh, but it's important that, that uh, you know, patients are aware about this. And then with hypertension, again, very common in general to have hypertension in our patients. But there's no doubt with the, um, uh, with the initial studies, we saw increasing risk of hypertension in patients on abrutinib. And we'll talk about that with the newer generations, although I got to tell you, the, the even some of the, it doesn't mean that hypertension goes away. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the head-to-head -head data as well. So again, I think this is a fair thing to, to discuss with the patients that they might develop hypertension and need to be on a blood pressure medication, or if they're already on blood pressure medications, that they might need this, uh, that they might need this uh, increased uh, or require additional agents uh, depending upon their blood pressure on therapy. Chrissy, let's talk about a little bit about a calibrate. Uh, so second generation of calibrutinib approved in mantle cell lymphoma and CLL. The dosing is the same in both diseases, so 100 milligrams by mouth every 12 hours. Um, the current formulation available is actually a film-coated tablet. Um, previously, there had been capsules, but now the tablets have taken their place and distribution of capsules stop stopped at the end of December. Um, so, if, so the acalabrutinib is administered with a full glass of water with or without food. If a dose is missed by more than three hours, it should be skipped, and the next dose should be taken on a regular schedule. There, again, are dosage adjustments uh, when used with certain other medications, such as CYP3A inducers, which, again, we'll talk about a little later in the program. So another second generation, Xanabrutinib, uh, approved in mantle cell lymphoma and now recently approved in CLL. 
This is given as 160 milligrams orally twice a day or 320 milligrams orally once a day. Uh, preferred dosing is still to be determined. Administration, we swallow whole with water and with or without food. We always advise the patients not to open, break, crush, or chew their capsules. And again, like any of the others, there's dosage adjustments recommended when used with certain medications, i.e. CYP3A inducers or inhibitors, which we will discuss further. And like all of the BTKs, we manage toxicity using treatment interruption, dose reduction, or discontinuation if needed. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, just to go a little bit more the review of these newer uh, BTK inhibitors, uh, certainly we notice more headaches with the calibrutinib. This has not, in my practice, been a problem uh, in terms of uh, a patient coming off of the drug. Usually this resolves in one to two months. Usually can be managed conservatively with uh, caffeine and Tylenol. Um, you can think about if, if, you know, if it really becomes unbearable, you can oftentimes we'll say, well, maybe we'll just take one, your evening dose at bedtime uh, since it's a twice a day drug and then sort of work them back into twice a day it, once the headaches are better. Although I have to say, I think we've, you know, that's a very rare event as well. So most people, this is something that that resolves. Um, xanabrutinib, there's definitely a little bit more neutropenia with xanabrutinib. And so, uh, you know, the guidelines recommend uh, dose interruption. I will tell you, I tend to try to get people through it. Um, uh, in other words, that if people really need therapy, if they need growth factor support, um, you know, I might use that, uh, particularly if they need therapy. Uh, certainly somebody who's got persistent neutropenia, I think that's a problem. And yes, I do think that their dose interruption uh, is warranted and, and dose reduction accordingly. Uh, but I think it depends on the context of when you start your patient on therapy, if they develop neutropenia and what you need to do about that. I think, again, persistent neutropenia needs an evaluation uh, and dose hold. Uh, I think if you're just having some beginning neutropenia, but you need to treat the patient, there are other ways to manage that. And then Pete, I think always important, let's talk about drug-drug interactions. Yeah, so unfortunately with most of our oral oncology agents, the BTK inhibitors are not immune to the issues with drug-drug interactions. And so this is really something that should be at the forefront of everyone's mind. And this is what really helps having a multidisciplinary team because the more people that are reviewing this, the better. And so the first thing that I want to encourage is that making sure that patients are always encouraged to have an active and updated med list. I think this is especially important when you're a only an oncology provider, perhaps. And if the patient gets care elsewhere, making sure that you know what other prescribers are putting these patients on, because there may be a lot of other drugs that don't fall into the oncology realm that we need to be aware of. So making sure that patients have active and complete medication lists at all times, especially if you don't work in a system where you can have a shared medical record and have access to that information. So of note, um, this can all be downloaded using the BTKI drug interaction tool, um, which can be used from counseling patients because this is a lot to try to commit to memory. So don't necessarily feel compelled to do so, but you have this reference available to you. And so you'll see as you go across, you don't only want to think about strong CYP3A4 or moderate CYP3A4 and inhibitors. You also want to be thinking about the CYP3A4 inducers. So when we first think about the CYP3A4 inhibitors that are strong, we think about things like clarithromycin, erythromycin, diltiazam, a lot of the azole antifungals, so voriconazole, posiconazole. These are things that are not infrequently prescribed to this patient population. And so with these, what you'll see is that a calibrutinib should really be avoided because we don't have a good drug uh, dose reduction at this time because of the strong inhibition. But with the brutinib, you can reduce the dose to 140 milligrams once a day, or if it's for short-term use, say it's a short course of erythromycin, maybe interrupt a brutinib for that short period of time. With xanabrutinib, you'd decrease the dose to 80 milligrams once a day. For your moderate inhibitors, you'll see there's slightly lower dose adjustments, and you'll see that a calibrutinib does have recommendations when using a moderate CYP3A4 inhibitor. When you move over to the strong CYP3A4 inducers, so think of things like rifampin, phenytoin, carbamazepine, you'll see that it's sort of the inverse in that um, you generally want to avoid the use because um, we don't really have a good understanding at this point of what the best dose for these patients are. And so for a lot of the things that you would be using those strong inducers, most frequently there are therapeutic alternatives that you could switch to the patient to instead of trying to get them through it. 
And then the other important column that I would address everyone's attention to is the gastric acid reducing agents. So abrutinib has no dose adjustments needed. Um, with the old acalabrutinib formulation, we used to always tell patients avoid PPIs, but now with the tablets, that's no longer an issue and patients can use regardless of PPIs and ingestion of food. And then again, xanabrutinib has no dose adjustments recommended when using gastric acid reducing agents. So we've, we're sort of now in the clear on this for the most part. And this concern has sort of alleviated itself with the new acalabrutinib formulation. But again, don't feel the need to commit this completely to memory. Use this BTKI drug interaction tool, which can be in the uh, reference in the materials. And, and that's really, really important because, um, you know, since our patients see multiple providers, I think this is one of the big things that comes up all the time is that many providers don't necessarily are not familiar with the drugs we use and that they're taking and may not check that. So it's always important to to loop in our pharmacy team. Uh, my nurses at nauseam go through the medication list every time the patient comes to their appointments, uh, even though they're like, don't you have it on, you have it on the system? And like, yes, but we don't know if anybody did anything, prescribed anything new to that to you. And it's always important to review their medication list and go through um, all their medications uh, because they change, because they might be changing for different reasons uh, for other medical problems. So let's talk a little bit about the head-to-head -head data um, that has emerged um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, both abrutinib and acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. And, and obviously, we have newer BTK inhibitors that are coming available as well. So obviously, abrutinib was the first to market as I knew it did. And obviously, the class effect of, of the side effects that we just reviewed, you know, we know that obviously there are differences in how selective these BTK inhibitors are. Uh, the less selective they are, the more potential for off-target effects, as you noted, um, including bleeding and cardiac to toxicity. Uh, and when you talk about uh, EGFR, you talk about rash and diarrhea and arthralgias. And so some of the newer generations uh, are a little bit more um, selective and have less off-target effects than a brutinib, which was first to market. Again, doesn't mean that they don't have any of these side effects. Um, from the head-to-head -head data I'm going to show you now, some of them just tend to be improved. This is the Elevate study. This was a relapse study done in patients uh, who have had previous treatment for their CLL or SLL. They were randomized to either a brutinib or a calibrutinib, uh, and the study demonstrated that a calibrutinib was non-inferior to a brutinib, um, so efficacy was maintained. But the difference was noted was with toxicity. And so there was a lower cumulative incidence of atrial fibrillation and hypertension with a calibrutinib versus a brutinib. And so that you can see from that slide here. And now we have much more maturing data out of this. This is a median follow-up already of 41 months, uh, continues to mature. And so that, uh, you know, certainly there, there seems to be less cardiac and less hypertension with a calibrutinib. Um, just to d delve into that a little bit more uh, deeper in terms of the numbers, you can see a calibrutinib had an incidence of about 10% of atrial fibrillation or flutter compared to about 16% with a brutinib, which is what we talked about with longer follow-up. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's important to note. In terms of hypertension and bleeding, you can see with hypertension, any grade about 10% with a calibrutinib versus about 23% uh, with a brutinib, again, any grade. And bleeding events, which could be minor to major, again, the total incidence, any grade, was about 38% with a calibrutinib and 51% with a brutinib. There were, uh, in terms of other issues uh, as well, um, we'll talk about a little bit about diarrhea and arthralgias, just to give you a little bit uh, note here. Um, here, there's a little bit less uh, diarrhea and a little bit uh, less arthralgias, again, a calibrutinib versus a brutinib. Although these were not statistically significant, in general, it seems that the side effects or adverse events that we normally see with this class are a little bit reduced, some statistically so, some not, you know, did not meet statistical significance, but reduced uh, in this head-to-head -head comparison. This was a, a study that was updated at the recent meeting, Congress at ASH, in, in December of 2022, looking at the overall adverse event burden score that was calculated, again, showing improvement. Uh, with a lower burden score with a calibrutinib versus a brutinib in, in patients treated uh, with this in the head-to-head -head study. 
And then there was another study that looked at the time to treatment discontinuation of patients who were receiving either abrutinib or calabrutinib. And again, again, this was a retrospective collection of over 2,500 patients with CLL. Um, short median observ observation time was about 16 months. Uh, but you could see that the treatment discontinu discontinuation was higher for patients on abrutinib than for a calabrutinib. So I think that does say something. Uh, particularly because currently, right now, um, obviously the, these agents, when they're given, are given as chronic continuous medicines. So when patients are facing some of these adverse events, even if they're not severe, they may want to come off drug if they have diarrhea or if they're having, you know, other, you know, just annoying side effects. And so it's important, you know, that may change when we talk about some of these uh, time limited combinations, as we talked about the abrutinib and venetoclax was approved as a combination in Europe and, and probably will be here soon as well, um, then they're going to be exposed less to the BTK inhibitors. And we just have to get them through that sort of year or maybe two years, depending upon treatment of these drugs. But it's important to note that, that obviously in the head-to-head -head studies uh, and on this retrospective studies, um, there were less treatment discontinuations in patients on a calibrinib versus a brutinib. So hot off the press was the other head-to-head -head study of xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. Also in a similar population, it was relapsed refractory patients, so patients who have already had prior treatment for their CLL, were randomized to either xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. Um, uh, obviously a younger study, we need more long-term follow-up, but they also showed uh, a statistically significant dif difference in lower rates of atrial fibrillation and, and, and a flutter uh, in patients who were on the xanabrutinib arm as opposed to uh, the abrutinib arm. And so they have done two subsequent analyses of these, um, both at the 12-month mark and subsequently this was just presented also in December at ASH uh, 2022 for a longer median follow-up now at about 30 months, again, showing lower rates of atrial fibrillation and atrial failure. Just to delve a little bit more deeply about that, you could see the cardiac events uh, listed here between the two arms. Serious cardiac events were about 2%, uh, six patients on xanabrutinib versus uh, 8%, 25 patients on the abrutinib arm. So I think just to kind of summarize some take home from, uh, in terms of the cardiovascular risk management and BTKs in CLL, uh, certainly, you know, if somebody develops an issue, you're going to work them up appropriately, send them if you need to, to a cardiologist, of course. I tend to obtain a baseline echo on my patients, and we'll talk, I think, more about that in some of the cases, um, and, but certainly educate them and see what their potential risk uh, stratification is for the development of some of these issues and, and counseling about that. Then you may consider using uh, one of the newer agents if you're concerned because they already have some comorbidities that make them at risk for developing an arrhythmia. Um, and so for patients with no cardiovascular risk factors, I think they, you can choose any of the BTK inhibitors, frankly. If there are other safety concerns, certainly you might favor a more selective BTK inhibitor, such as a calabrutinib or xanabrutinib. Or if you're really worried because they have lots of issues and are on antiplatelet, anticoagulant agents, hard to control hypertension, you might not give the class at all and consider something else like a BCL2 inhibitor. Patients with cardiovascular risk factors well-controlled atrial fibrillation, hypertension, heart failure, or valvular heart disease, you might want to consider one of the newer generations because of the head-to-head -head data showing less uh, cardiac issues with uh, a calabrutinib and xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. Let's talk a little bit about BTK intolerance. Um, there were small, there were some, some studies that looked at for patients, again, remember that abrutinib was the first to market. So there were some patients who, as we've learned about the class of adverse events that are with this class in general, um, as the newer agents became available, there were some studies looking at patients who had developed an intolerance while being on abrutinib, uh, and then were switched to a newer generation BTK inhibitor, such as a calabrutinib or xanabrutinib. And so this was a study about 60 patients looking at the use of a calabrutinib in patients who had an intolerance. And for those individuals, the majority of those patients did not develop the same intolerance when they were on a calibrinib, or if they did, uh, the majority of them were at a lower grade. So, so take-home point is, if the, if the class is working well and the adverse event isn't severe, where you really need to change the class, and I'll give an example. I think the, the most important is thinking about somebody who has a major hemorrhage. 
you might not want to re-challenge them on a different BTK inhibitor. But if they have a mild issue, um, you might want to, and they're doing well on the BTK inhibitor, you might want to switch to a newer BTK inhibitor to see if you can then extend the life of that class versus using another agent. Remember, when we think about these disorders, they're chronic disorders, um, you know, until we develop curative strategies, uh, whether it be CLL or, or mantle cell, you know, I think that many of us think that you got to think about not only what they're on now, but their subsequent lines of therapy. So if they're doing well, you might want to consider changing them. And I think this is a small pilot that really shows that that's a potential option in some of the patients. There was another study with Xanabrutinib similarly, and these were in patients who, again, had either an abrutinib intolerance or a smaller number already at that point were treated with a calabrutinib. And so then they were rechallenged on Xanabrutinib. Um, and you can see here that the majority of those uh, in the dark blue did not recur. Um, those were their intolerance issues that they had previously on abrutinib or calabrutinib. Some of them did recur, some of them at a lower grade or at the same grade. So I think it gives you the potential option, again, of possibly changing them to a newer uh, or a next generation BTK inhibitor if they have an intolerance issue. What about non-covalent BTK inhibitors? I touched upon this briefly. They're not yet approved. Uh, for these diseases, but based on some of the more maturing data that's coming uh, to light, pertubrinib being the furthest so long in development, um, uh, based on some of the studies such as the Bruin study, you can see here that this was also looked at in patients who are intolerant to prior uh, covalent BTK inhibitors. Uh, and so in that setting as well, um, the majority of those individuals, there was no recurrence, that's the green um, so when they were re-challenged on pertubrutinib, they, they, they did not have the, the same adverse event reoccur. Uh, some of them did, uh, did reoccur at a lower grade. Uh, some of them still had some severity, but again, showing that the majority of patients can possibly uh, go from one BTK inhibitor to another. And now there, here's some evidence that you can go from a covalent to a non-covalent BTK inhibitor. So let's talk a little bit about how to use some of what we just uh, discussed in, in terms of real patient cases. And so we're going to go through some uh, uh, illustrations with patients uh, so we can so talk about some of the particular issues that do come up and how to potentially manage them. So let's talk about the first case, Michael, who is a 75-year-old gentleman with symptomatic CLL. Uh, with B symptoms. He is unmutated and he, he t is TP53 wild type. His medical history includes hypertension and renal insufficiency with a creatinine of 2.1. And so I'm going to bring my colleagues into this discussion to talk a little bit about this. So first, what baseline labs and medication lists should be reviewed? And then subsequently, we'll talk about what are the care coordination issues uh, to address. And so, Pete, maybe I'll have you start off about baseline labs and medications. Yeah, sure. So in terms of baseline labs, there's several that we would think of. I mean, clearly, these patients at this point would have probably received a ton of CBCs, but definitely want to get a CBC, um, a BMP, and a liver panel, um, because mainly we want to think, you know, some of the drugs, like we talked about, abrutinib has some dose adjustments if the patient does have hepatic impairment or can't be used. Uh, for several of the BTK inhibitors if they have more advanced liver impairment. Um, so those are the main baseline labs I would recommend getting. The other thing you'd want to think about probably is getting a, a hep B panel if the patient does not have one recently. You know, we traditionally think of doing this with our anti-CD20 antibodies, but there's a lot of practices that would recommend just getting one in general at the outset of therapy. So I would highly recommend doing that. In terms of the medication lists, again, we sort of alluded to this earlier, but making sure that you know all the meds that the patients are on. And the important thing to note here is especially knowing what non-traditional meds the patients are taking. So, you know, we see here a lot of patients who are on different herbal supplements or they take certain nutritional foods. We actually want to know about those things because a surprising number of them can have unintended drug-drug interactions or food-drug interactions with the BTK inhibitors, along with several other drugs to note. And so it's really important to make sure we know everything that the patient is taking from a prescription and non-prescription standpoint. And then we also want to think about, do you drink grapefruit juice every day? So it's really important to sit down and have a real in-depth conversation so you know all of the aspects that you need to be considering when you're going to talk to them about dosing, drug interactions, and safety issues that may come up. 
Okay, and Chrissy, regarding some of the care coordination issues. Yeah, I mean, reiterating some of what Dr. Campbell already said, um, important to have a baseline cardiac workup, EKG, and echocardiogram. Um, coordinate with the patient's cardiologist. Uh, if they do not have a cardiologist, um, maybe involve a cardiologist for assistance in managing these patients. Um, you know, work with the pharmacist to go through the medication lists um, and check interactions, as Pete so clearly stated. Uh, and then educating the patients basically on all the possible side effects, um, especially the cardiovascular side effects that could impact them. So let's just say, for all intents and purposes, uh, based on his age and hypertension history, Michael receives a calibrunib, right? So he's got hypertension, and we said that it was already uh, something that was uh, less frequent with a calibrunib. So he was started on a calibrunib. What are some of the educational points that we would consider about dosing and, and safety issue? And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Chrissy take this because, uh, you know, she does this with a lot of my patients. So obviously, you're going to counsel the patient on the general class events for BTKs um, because those, those, those are part of all the drugs. Um, but then you want to discuss the unique AEs. So for example, headaches with a calibrutinib, you want to stress this, that this is a possibility early on, usually resolves within the first one to two months. And as we discussed, um, very responsive to Tylenol and caffeine. Um, you want to ensure they understand the twice daily dosing um, and the, how important that is with compliance. These drugs only work if you take them as they're prescribed. Um, and then, of course, we would reiterate the new formulation of the tablet just in case for some reason they had known previously it was a capsule. And just explain this new tablet allows for uh, co-administration with their PPIs or other reflux medications. Um, now, what if instead of a calibrunib, we switch the agent and Michael receives Xanabrutinib. I think what additional points, what Chrissy, what, what we often talk about in our clinic, what would we tell this individual uh, if he was starting Xanabrutinib instead? So again, general class education, but with this, the main, we can see more neutropenia with Xanabrutinib. So we would, uh, we, would for, we would tell these patients we need to monitor their blood counts closely. There is a chance they might need some growth factor. There's a chance of, um, you know, a dose being reduced or possibly a hold. And then we would also explain to them there are two different options for dosing and that this would be decided upon with the patient and the physician. Yeah. And just to talk a little bit about this, I know we kind of we go around this discussion a little bit. You know, it was approved for both once and twice daily dosing. There is no doubt that most of the data generated with this drug has been on twice daily dosing. Um, and, and hopefully, although when they looked at the kinetics, um, there was not a difference in the smaller number of patients that were treated with once daily dosing. Uh, I've encouraged more data in this. I think though, if, and, and hopefully we will get that soon. Um, but I do think that if you have a patient that you're very nervous about compliance, so I tend to prescribe twice daily dosing just because we have more data in that setting. But if you have a person who you're worried about compliance, and you really want once daily dosing, your choices are abrutinib or xanabrutinib once daily. And so I think that you can potentially do that and consider that. Uh, hopefully we'll get more data uh, just to, to see that once daily dosing is just as good as twice daily dosing, uh, but, but certainly uh, it was approved in such fashion. And, and there is some data, it's just not the majority of data. Okay, so let's switch cases. Now we're gonna talk about a different patient. So we have Susan who's a 70-year-old woman with symptomatic TP53 uh, mutated CLL. She has no comorbidity. She has a good performance status. She initiated a brutinib at 420 milligrams daily, but within six months, she experiences painful arthralgias that are grade two. So let's talk about what are the recommended interventions and what potential counseling strategies should be considered. Yeah, so I think... We sort of talked about this before, that this is a, one of the more difficult things to manage. Um, fortunately, it doesn't happen with extreme frequency, but it, when it does happen, it's really significant for patients because it's something that they have to deal with on a day-in, day-out basis. And so in terms of interventions, you know, this is where a collaboration with the provider, the nurse practitioner, and the pharmacist can come in handy um, because we, you have a couple of different options that you can choose. So the the two um, main ones that you'll probably most commonly see would be acetaminophen or your NSAIDs, uh, especially if it's in a certain joint or located to one area, you could use topical diclofenac. That is an option. 
The one thing that I would caution, though, that you need to think about is prolonged use of these agents is not going to be optimal for these patients. You know, we think about things like the potential bleeding risk with all of these drugs. And so the longer that you have them on something like an NSAID, the more you're going to want to start to think about it. So these are sort of temporary fixes to see if the problem goes away rather than long-term solutions. So we don't want to think about putting them on an NSAID, it solves the problem, so keep them on it forever to manage the side effect. You're going to want to trial them off of it again and see if the side effect returns. You could also do low-dose steroids. Um, that is an option that is less frequently used. And then if none of these happen to help, that's when you want to start thinking about dose holds or dose holidays. And so if you are able to hold the drug for a limited period of time, the patient uh, has the symptoms uh, abate, you then start them back up again. And sometimes it will recur, but sometimes, fortunately, it will not. In patients that it does recur or does not get any better, these are the patients you'll want to start thinking about dose reductions or potentially in the long run, think about switching agents altogether. And so if we take a look at this screen, what we can see is that we have a, a bit of an algorithm that we have available to us. And what's nice about this is that it guides us through how to manage the patient based on the severity of the symptoms that they're facing. So breaking it up between grade one and two, for which you would ask the patient then, does it affect your ADLs? This is when you need to have the conversation with the patient and try to be candid with them. You know, a lot of patients will try to hide their side effects. So they'll say, oh, you know, my knees are really bugging me, but you know, it's fine, I'll deal with it. But you have to interrogate them a little bit and find out like, okay, but has it stopped you from doing things you enjoy? Has it stopped you from going out for your walks? And if it's really limiting their ADLs, you would then think about dose reduction or monitor for a period of time and then see whether or not it goes away on its own. For more severe instances up front, so we think about grade three instances, you can think about holding it right off the bat, um, given the severity of the, um, the side effect that the patient's experiencing. And then based on whether or not it improves, then decide, do you restart at a lower dose or do you discontinue altogether? And so I think it's a really helpful algorithm that you can use to walk through for patients um, and try to see, based on the severity, what should your treatment approach be? And this is one of those cases where, again, despite the, uh, you know, going through that algorithm, if, if it's severe, you might want to consider challenging them on an alternative BTK, for example. That's another possibility as well. So now let's talk about another case. This is a patient with a relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, so Robert is 63. Um, he has mantle cell lymphoma with a KI67 of 30%, who is on therapy with bendamustine and rituximab. Um, he did not want to go to uh, a, a transplant. And so three years after initiating treatment, he progresses and he presents to, for next evaluation. So now you can consider the usage of BTK inhibitors, which are approved in this, second, in this setting. Um, but let's talk about what we should convey to the patient uh, who is now thinking about doing a BTK inhibitor. And again, similarly, what are the safety protocols uh, you know, in a patient with mantle cell lymphoma. Yeah, so we always want to note that these currently these patients have been previously treated. Um, they do have the option of of three BTK inhibitors. Um, the obvious difference just being that with a brutinib, if that was what was chosen, the dosing is just higher than that in COL. Um, other than that, though, um, the education stays the same on the drugs. It doesn't change based on the disease. It's a, it's the same across the board as is safety management and how you choose an agent for these patients. You're going to look at the patient, you're going to look at comorbidities, you're going to look at previous therapy, and you're going to make the safest decision for the patient. Obviously, they have all these options available to them, uh, given the approval in the second line setting for uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Chrissy, can you talk about, you know, where you might, you know, differences again between the agents or maybe what you might think about when, we, and, and obviously you do this in conjunction with your team, not putting this all on you, of course. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, when we talk about this, clearly we talk about each of the drugs and, and, and we, as we get, you know, granular about some of the side effects that we reviewed, you can sort of pick and choose a little bit or, or talk about sort of the education we would do with the patient based on the different drugs. Yeah, so... You know, Robert is pretreated, but it doesn't look like there's any known comorbidities. Um, 
So abrutinib, again, you would note the, do the differing dosage for mantle cell lymphoma, and you would have to stress the cardiovascular side effects. Again, those concern patients the most, and you'd have to talk about those risks with the patient. A calibrutinib uh, has this special side effect of possible headaches, uh, usually in the first one to two months. Again, um, they're very responsive to Tylenol and caffeine, um, but you want, you know, you'd have to lead the patient through that and let them know that that can occur. Along with GI events, um, a calibrin can have some GI events, like some diarrhea early at initiation. And then xanabrutinib. So we, neutropenia, again, these patients have probably previously seen growth factor, um, especially if he has had bendamustine rituxan in the past. So you talk about that. They might need growth factor or they may need dose reduction in their medications at some point. Yeah. And so certainly, let's say somebody had um, we were worried that Robert had a lot of cardiovascular comorbidities. We might choose a newer generation. If he had profound cytopenias and bone marrow involvement, you know, maybe we would decide not to use anabrutinib, although you could support them through that. Maybe we'd use a calibrutinib. Uh, so I think you can pick and choose a little bit if they have no cardiovascular events, what, uh, meaning no comorbidities whatsoever, and Robert is fine. I think you can choose any one of these agents. But you could fine tune your choices depending upon the patient, their comorbidities, uh, you know, so on and so forth, are things that you have to worry about because he was pre-treated and so on and so forth. So I think that's important. So just from uh, some take-home points from our whole team, uh, first of all, as we know that these, the BTK inhibitors are really highly efficacious agent and now are standard of care uh, choices for both CLL, SLL, mantle cell lymphoma, and now obviously also in marginal zone and Waldenstrom. So this is a class that will not go away. And so I want to have my colleagues also continue to summarize from a team approach how important these agents are. Yeah, when treating patients with a BTK, the team should be prepared to provide education on safety profiles and communicate important information that can impact treatment choices and delivery of care. Speaking from my nursing side, these patients are anxious when they start therapy. We need to provide as much education and love for them as we can and make sure that they understand that they can reach out to us at any time for anything they need so we can help them through. Yeah, and definitely, you know, pharmacy, but be, all providers should be prepared to address these drug interactions that you encounter throughout all the different phases of care. Um, know the dosing differences between the different disease states and particularly in the event of drug-drug interactions. Um, you know, pharmacists can help with the new therapeutic formulations, such as the change from uh, capsules to tablets for calibrutinib, and then definitely use the whole team-based approach to facilitate access to therapy, whether that's copay assistance or getting through prior authorizations, and really just reinforcing that it, it takes a village to care for these patients. And uh, the more you utilize this multidisciplinary team-based approach, the better off that the patients ultimately will be. I could not have said that better. So <laughs> I want to thank again my colleagues for being and doing this activity with me, Christina Rusimano, Pete Campbell. Uh, this concludes our exploration of team-based safety management. I hope you've found this activity informative and useful for your practice. And again, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TBV 860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca.